Tonight, I'm going to be sharing a word with you simply titled Rooted and Grounded. Rooted and grounded. And, and you know, even as I share this, it's going to, um, it's kind of like one of those God is great type sermons. But I believe, too, at the same time, uh, it, it is a message that though you have heard it and though you've heard it said time and time again, I feel the Lord is wanting to emphasize it tonight more than ever. Let me start with this with a story. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in prayer and I began to ask the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit, would you teach me how to love Jesus? Holy Spirit, teach me, great counselor, great teacher, teach me how to love Jesus. Have you ever had one of those moments in your walk with the Lord where you're just like, I don't feel like I love you good enough? Like, I, I, there's a Missy Edwards song that I love that just says, Lord, let me love you more. I love that song. It says, let me love you more. It's, it's all that I desire is to love you more. So I begin to pray in that vein uh, of, Lord, let me love you more. Teach me how to love Jesus better. And in that moment, I, I, I heard Holy Spirit say, I'm going to take you on a journey to love Jesus. I'm taking you on the journey of loving Jesus. So I was like, like an eager student. I had my journal, I had my pen. I was ready for like some things. All right, Lord, t show me what to do. Show me, Lord, how I can do this daily and do this practically. Like, what do you want me to do? Because I'll do it. And in that moment, I heard the Lord all of a sudden change his tone and change even the way he's speaking to me. And he spoke this scripture to me that was so clear and I knew exactly what he was saying. He said this, we love him because he first loved us. And, and I was like, but is there something I can do? <laughs> Amen? Like, Awesome. What do I do? How, how do I love him better? And I knew what God was telling me was, Jacob, you'll never be able to love him rightly until you understand how much he loves you. Because we've got to understand our love is a response to his love. My consecration is a response to his radical love for us. And, and, and I, I, you know, it's so interesting. It's like, so, so you're telling me the core of tonight's message is that God loves me? Yes, it is. Amen. God loves you. And, and I, I want it, that, that to become, because I think so, so many times we can, can uh, feel like we're too mature for that. And we want to just, be, yeah, I know God loves me. I know, use me, God. And the Lord is like, you're missing the entire point of everything. And you've got to understand how much my heart is for you. Now, turn me in your Bible to 1 John. I'm going to read uh, this where, where he uh, spoke this to me from Scripture, 1 John 4, 7. And, and let me just say this. I love 1 John. I love the Gospel of John, and I love 1 John, uh, especially, you know, John 15. Jesus even said, as the fathers love me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And in the Gospel of John, what, how do we find John referring to himself? The one in whom Jesus loves. He, he literally referred to himself as the one in whom Jesus loves. Why? Because I believe that John the Apostle had such a revelation of the affection of Jesus towards him, it affected everything in his life. So much so that 1 John 3 says, Behold what manner of love is this, that we should be called children of God. He had a revelation of the love of God because he had a revelation that he is the one in whom Jesus loves. And if you want to understand God's love for you, read 1 John. And if you want to understand our call to love others, read 1 John. Why? Because when you understand that you're the one that Jesus loves, you'll stop looking at everybody else as just your brother and sister in the faith. But no, you'll start looking at them as Richard in whom Jesus loves. 
It's hard to be in competition with somebody when you refer to them as the one in whom Jesus loves. It's hard to be bitter at somebody when you think about them as being the one in whom Jesus loves. If there's somebody in your life getting on your nerves, just start, put them in your phone as the one in whom Jesus loves. <laughs> Amen. Listen to this, 1 John 4, 7. I'm telling you, this book is so good. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God, I love this word, was manifested toward us that God has sent his only son, begotten son, into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means the turning away of one's wrath by sacrifice to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. Get that. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed that the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, because perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. I pray tonight some of you would be made perfect in love in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, we love him. We love him. We love him. We love him because. Everybody shout because. Because he first loved us. Period. And I want us to grasp that tonight as divine revelation that our lives are meant to be a response to the beauty of his love. You see, just, you know, I think a lot of us are, had that same mindset. I know for me, I've always wanted to, I've always struggled with and felt like I need to earn his affection. I, I need, what, what can I do? Even that was my prayer. Okay, Lord, I want to love you more. What do I need to do when what he wanted me to do was just understand how much he loved me? What, what can I do? Where do I need to go? How, how do I do this? But we understand that the basis of the gospel is this. Romans 5, verse 6. The basis of the gospel is this. But God demonstrated his own love for us. How? That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That, that's the demonstration of God's love. That there was nothing beautiful about you. There was nothing within us that, that, that was desirable. We, how many of y'all can look back at your past and you're like, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Like, I look at my teenage self, and I'm like, Lord, thank you for your mercy. <laughs> Have you ever looked back at the way you used to talk to people and been like, I was a jerk. <laughs> Amen? Like, like, even while we were yet sinners, Christ went to the cross. for That was his demonstration of his love. And, and I remember... Years ago when I, was, um, when I was an intern, I was interning in Pensacola, Florida, and I was in prayer, and I just said, God, can you show me how much you love me? Meaning, can you do something for me? Like, like can you just show me how much you love me? And I felt the Lord just say, Jacob, I already did. Wow. He demonstrated his own love towards us that even while we were yet sinner, Christ died for you. I, I truly believe that when we get this one thing settled within us, everything in your, if you're having a hard time praying, if you're having a hard time spending time with the Lord, get this settled and that will fix itself. Yeah. 
If you're having a hard time loving others, get this settled and that will fix itself. When you understand that his heart is for you. I love what Song of Solomon says. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Have you ever just thought about that? That God desires you. That you are his beloved. The way that he looks at you, it moves his heart. Church, can I tell you, you move his heart. There's a song. I'm just going to give you a whole list of just good songs ago, YouTube later. There's a song by Misty Edwards that says, Do you know the way you move me? Do you know the way you move me? I remember hearing that song for the first time. She's singing, do you know the way you move me? You've ravished my heart. And for the longest time, I thought that was me singing to the Lord. Lord, do you know the way you move me? And then I began to realize I'm not singing at the Lord. The Lord is singing that over me. And he's wanting to get your attention to say, do you know the way you move me? Do you know how, how when you worship, it moves my heart? Do you know when you pray? Do you know when I, when I touch your heart and, and, and you turn off the TV and you draw away to the secret? But do you know how that moves my heart? Do you know when you love your neighbor as yourself, how that moves me? You move his heart, his heart, and his affection is for you. Uh, if you have a Bible, flip with me to Ephesians 3.14. Ephesians 3.14. This is Paul praying for the church at Ephesus. He's praying for the church at Ephesus. And I encourage you um, uh, to, to do this. Um, Kenneth Hagin actually did this a lot. He would go through these prayers in Ephesians and he would replace words in them to pray them over himself. So he would pray, God, I ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and all of Jesus. When you pray the prayers of the Bible over yourself, it's powerful. So this is Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 14, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. I love verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Whoa. Just think about that. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Second part of that. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. He's praying you would know something that passes knowledge. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in you, that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Get what he said right there. That you, he's praying that you would be rooted and grounded in love. What does that show me? That the beginning, the genesis, the first place starting point of your life needs to be love. It needs to be love. That you would be rooted and grounded in love. Here's another good song for you to go get messed up to. And I'm, I'm telling you, it'll get you, all right? It's called The Gift by Kevin Prosh and Heidi Baker. And it is so Holy Ghost. If you know anything about Kevin Prosh, like if you just Google it, like stuff gets wild. You know what I'm saying? Like one of the first things I listened to, he was like singing through a conch shell. So there is glory through the river. And I was like, bro, is he singing through a conch shell? And he kept on bringing out these random instruments. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> they had like a life-size Ark of the Covenant on the stage behind them. I was like, dude, come on. We need one of those. <laughs> well, in this song, is the, the chorus is, the joy of being lovesick. Have you ever heard that before? The pleasure is the love in you. Well, <laughs> the entire time he's singing, Heidi Baker's in the background getting blasted. Like, I just imagine her in the studio. She's just like, oh, like just getting touched by the Lord. One minute she's laughing, the other minute she's weeping. But it's one of the most anointed songs I've ever heard in my entire life. 
And, and he says this, we plant our lives in the soil of your love and we watch them grow and bloom. The aching longing to see you face to face. I don't remember the rest of that verse. The joy of being loved, that's how it goes. But I love that. We plant our lives in the soil of your love and watch them go and move. Even this, term, this, this verse right here that we would be rooted in love. Listen, you've got to understand that the strength in which you pull for your life is your root system in the love of God. It's, it's are your roots deep within the love of God? And I, 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 as I was preparing this and I read, the, read this in Ephesians 3, I was sitting on my front porch and I was just watching. I was looking at this beautiful, massive pine tree we have in my front yard. It's huge. It's ginormous. I was looking at this massive pine tree and, and I just began to think about how when a seed is planted into the soil, the seed has no power within itself, but it's the transforming power within the soil that changes it from being a seed to a tree. And I don't know about you, but I don't walk through the woods and be like, man, look at that seed. That is a big seed. No, 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 no. This is what I want to show you. When you plant yourself in the soil of God's love, you get a new identity. But the problem is a lot of us, we're wanting to be seeds on the surface. And we're trying to grow, but we haven't planted ourselves in the crazy, radical love of God. Why? Because unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. And, and unless we are planted in the soil of God, in the soil of God's love, and unless we grow in Him, we'll never be able to bear fruit. John 15, abide in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Listen, as long as you stay planted in the love of God, you will bear fruit. But we've got to say, am I willing to bury myself in it? Am I willing to be covered in the love of God to the point where things begin to change in my life? Things begin to transition. Things begin to transform in my life. And I'm no longer a seed, but now I can fully step into the ultimate purpose of God in my life. Why? Because I'm rooted and grounded in love. You've got to get, I love this. Colossians 3, 3 says this, for you died and your life is now hidden in God. Just as the seed goes into the ground and dies, so you must be willing to go into the ground and die. And I love this. Your life is now hidden in God. What does that show me? And when you're pursuing God, you're seeking God for your calling and purpose. As you get closer to him, the more you're going to find it. Your life is now hidden in God. You've got to get rooted. Second thing is you've got to get grounded. Grounded. That, that term grounded is translated as a, it's a, a describing a foundation. And, and the hard thing is, is that a lot of times if our foundation isn't secure, what we build upon it will never be steady. If the foundation has issues, that's why if you ever purchase a home, you need to get an inspection. Amen? Because if the, if the foundation is messed up, it doesn't matter how beautiful the home is. It doesn't matter what color the walls are. It doesn't matter how many bedrooms it has. If it's built on something broken, the rest of the house will be faulty. You've got to be rooted and grounded in his love. And I, one of the things I want to encourage you with tonight is, it, I love this scripture from Psalm 18, 19. For you to understand that it's not by works lest any man should boast. That it's not by anything that you have done that we are here today. It, it, it's, it's an incredible thing to step back and be like, Lord, I don't even know how I'm here right now. 
Does anybody ever feel like that? Sometimes I look at my wife and my kids and I'm like, Lord, I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I'll get up to like minister and preach and I'll be like, for real? <laughs> like I see God doing things in my life that he promised me he was going to do and I'm like, Lord, this, I didn't do anything. to Amen? Amen? That's a beautiful place to be. Even like Abraham refused to receive money after he refused to receive part of the plunder. Why? Lest he say another man made him wealthy. And there's a beautiful place to be. It says, no, it's not by anything I've done. It's only by the goodness of God. Yes. Psalm 18, 19. And I, I feel like this can be so encouraging to someone. It says this. He brought me out to a broad place. He delivered me. Why? Because he delighted in me. He, it's, it's the prayer of David. It's actually even quoted in 2 Samuel 20 as well. He delivered you because he delights in you. And, and one of the greatest enemies that we as Christian face is shame, guilt, and condemnation. It's one of the main strategies of the enemy is to constantly stand before you as the accuser of the brethren. To make you feel like, like, like you're not a son, like you're not a daughter, like you haven't done enough, that you're always falling short of the love of God, that you're always displeasing to him when the exact opposite is true. He delivered you. Listen, he's writing that from a place. He was in a bad place. Listen, tonight, some of you guys are going to get set free. Can I just tell you something? It's by nothing you've done. It's, it's, it's by nothing you've done. I, I remember I would, when I was bound by a sin cycle of pornography, I could not. I didn't even know what to do anymore. And I just remember the Lord stepping into my life, setting me free to a place of freedom I didn't even know was imaginable. And it was like, oh, you did that. You can't will your way into freedom. I've tried and failed. I remember being so broken and being like, Lord, if I could like, take this out physically, I would. But I can't. And that's the perfect recipe for the love of God to flood your heart and say, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You can't earn your freedom. You can't earn your salvation. You can't earn his affection. Why? Because it's already towards you. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus is baptized and the heavens are open and the spirit comes down as a dove and alights upon him. And the voice comes from heaven says this, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't healed anyone. He hasn't raised the dead. He hasn't preached a message. He is just a son. And I love it that the father didn't say, this is my beloved Messiah. He didn't identify him by his vocation. He identified him by his identity. You're a son. You're a daughter. And some of y'all need to get set free. You're not just a pastor. You're not just a prophet. You're not a missionary. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. That's who I am. If I never touch a microphone again, I'm still a son. This is, this is my beloved son. He, he could have said, this is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. This is him, everyone. Listen to him. No, no, no. Why? Because it wasn't for everybody else. It was between him and Jesus. I'm not even talking to anybody else. John the Baptist, you can close your ears. Everybody else, you can close your ears. Jesus, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And some of y'all need to hear that voice. See, see, I struggled with this for years because the foundation in which I built, built my, my walk of the Lord on was ministry. And I began to believe just through, it was no, nobody else was doing it, just through me. I began to believe that the Lord saved me. 
because he needed me in his calling and purpose. And yes, he does. I understand. Yes, yes. We, we have a calling. We have a purpose. We have a plan that only you can fulfill. I, yes, I believe that. But at the same time, what I found was that rather me knowing the Lord as father, I knew him as business partner. And we would co-labor together. We would minister together. I would preach on the love of God, but I never understood the love of God. And I'm telling you, if you build your life on that, one day it's going to fall. Why? Because ministry will never satisfy you. Prophesying won't satisfy you. Book deals won't satisfy you. Stadiums won't satisfy you. That's why people who are secure in their identity and purpose can preach to a room of five people, can preach to the person behind the checkout counter at Walmart and go home satisfied and fulfilled. Why? Because I built my ministry on the fact that I'm a son. And you can strip it all away and I'll still be a son. You can take it all away and I'll still be his son. I'm not trying to earn his affection. His desire is for me. Listen, let's just be real. We love our kids, but they don't do much for us. They just eat all my snacks. Is anybody else's kids eat nonstop? Like, dude. You just ate dinner and you're going to the snack cabinet. Stop it. Like, man. All you do is eat your snacks. You buy them stuff. They're always growing. So you got to buy like eight different sizes of shoes a year. That bro, I just bought you those shoes. And you don't, they don't fit you no more. They don't, our kids don't really do much for us. It's like, I don't keep my kids around the house because they help me clean. They make a mess all the time. But I delight in them. Oh my goodness, how I delight in them. Behold, what manner of love is this? That we should be called children of God. And, and my love for my kids compared to God's love for us is so weak. I was thinking about it even with Olive. Olive's like a year and a half. And we're in that fun stage where she just wants to walk around all the time. So she loves being outside. And so she, she, she has, you know how, tolerant, she doesn't know how to bend her knees yet. And it's, it's pollen season, so she's got a runny nose all the time. <laughs> and for some reason, everything she says has the letter G in it. So she loves bugs. She'll see a bug and be like, gug. <laughs> and hear a dog bark, she'll be like, gog. <laughs> and a car will go by, she'll be like, gar. And I'll be like, yes, that is a gar. <laughs> and she knows, I'm telling you. Whenever we, we, we have, you know, the Alexas uh, in our room and whenever we get around them, she starts doing this, gark, gark, meaning turn on baby shark. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I've done baby gark so many times, I can't even tell you. But I delight in them. It's, it's, it's interesting, we're, we're just outside together, walking around. She's telling me about something, I'm just like, Absolutely. And I just can't help but think about the Father's heart for us when He's just in our presence. We just come into we're just doing life with Him. Listen, some of y'all just need to include God in your life. Some need to walk through Walmart and be like, man, uh, this milk is really expensive. Should I try almond milk? You know, I don't know. <laughs> just include Him in your life. Because I've got to understand, his heart is for me, period. Like, period. I'm sorry, I just squeaked, period. <laughs> you know, it's, and, and it's so funny how much we love our kids. Because even when they make us stuff, which you shout out to Rebecca and Zeke for our, being our incredible kids pastors. They're doing an incredible job. Last Wednesday night, Reese came out literally blue from paint. 
and like a painted picture. We have boxes of pictures. I can't throw them away. I'm very nostalgic. Lexi can't. I'm very nostalgic. And I'm just like, I just hoard all of their stuff. And it's undiscernible what they actually made. But it moves my heart. And I feel, man, when I think about that sometimes, sometimes I get so like, like, you know, in my head and about different things. And the Lord's like, Jacob, just stop. And, and sometimes our ministry is just bringing a painted picture to him. And he's like, thank you. <laughs> and he puts it on the fridge. Or I, I saw this picture on the internet and it like almost brought me to tears because I was like, man, how oftentimes is that my love for the Lord look like this. Throw that picture up. It's Look at that. Look how happy she is. Look how, look at that joy. You know that dad was so overcome. But look how happy she is. And sometimes I feel like I'm the kid with the screwdriver, like, Lord, look what I did for you. And, you know, the other day I was doing yard work and I had a wheelbarrow and, and my beautiful little girl, Piper, wanted to help me. She just came up there like, Dad, I want to help you. So I, I, come on, baby, help me. I need to put all these pine cones, remember the pine trees, all these pine cones into this wheelbarrow. Said, yes. So we start going, well, at some point she tries to move the wheelbarrow oh. and it just dumps. And I remember in that moment thinking about that just with us for the Lord. I could have gotten frustrated. I could have gotten annoyed. But more than anything, I was happy she was there with me. Can I tell you that the Lord is happy that you're with him? That, that when you root and ground yourself in love, I'm telling you, people do crazy things for love. Omar Simpson said, Amen. amen. All, my, all my married people said, amen. amen. You remember when you first started courting? If that's still a word, I don't know if we still court. I still don't know what it means, it just sounds better than dating. But bro, when you fall in love, it's over. I'm talking about the real love. I'm talking about like, like when I fell in love with Lexi, I instantly became a jerk to every other girl. I, had, I didn't have any more girlfriend that we were just friends and we hung out. No, 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 no. I shut them off. Why? Because I'd fallen in love. When you fall, when you fall in love, man... I, when we got married, we were broke. We had no money. But I had a revelation. I can be poor and single or poor and married, so I'll be poor and married. I know two salaries are better than one. Ecclesiastes 18 verse 1. And what I found is when you're in love, what should be a burden is not actually a burden. When people view missionaries who've literally given their life on the mission field, the Mother Teresa's who lived and died amongst the poorest of the poor, how are people able to endure that? Love. I, the revelation of the love of God so moves my heart that he loves me. And if he loves me, that means he loves them. And I can be a channel for that love for them. I, you know, Bandy, you can go ahead and come on up. I feel tonight, I, I know it might feel, again, it's, it, you're telling me tonight's message is about God loves me? Yes, it is. 
But as soon as we mature from that, we miss it all. As soon as that stops moving us, as soon as the the thought of him on the cross doesn't move our hearts, as soon as we take for granted that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once we take that for granted, the, desi- the, the amount of the affection of God towards us, we begin to miss it in our lives. And I, I felt this so strongly, even as the Lord has been teaching me this. He keeps on bringing me back there. You know, I, I find it interesting. I was talking about John the Beloved earlier. John wrote about the love of God in uh, John 14, 15, 16. John wrote 1 John, uh, 2 John, and 3 John. He understood the love of God. Well, do you remember, even as the scripture is saying that you would be rooted and grounded in love? Remember, that was Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Well, there's another letter written to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And what does he say to them? What does Jesus say to them? You're doing all this great stuff, man. You're doing awesome. Nevertheless, I have one thing against you. You've left first love. And again, and this is a proper interpretation of this. It is true. Yes, I've left the, the way I first felt about you when I got saved. But could it also mean you've forgotten how I felt about you? You've, why, why? Because if you kept that revelation, what does it say? First love and first works. Works rooted in love are not bad. Amen? Why? Because I'm not trying to earn his affection. I'm I'm doing works out of his affection. I'm not a Pharisee trying to earn righteousness, I'm already clothed in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And and I feel tonight the Lord is wanting to bring you back to that place and He's wanting to love on you as His son and and your daughter just to say, hey, hey, I just want to let you know my heart is for you. My, My desire is for you that the God of the heavens and the earth, the sun, moon, and the stars, his affection is towards you.